The children uh, screamed with excitement. My parents had, had bought them their very own uh, basketball goal uh, for Christmas, and they were excited. I was not, not because I didn't want them to play basketball. I just, uh, to be honest, I really just didn't want to put this thing together. And so it stayed in the box uh, in our front room for really far too long uh, before I finally had the courage to open it up. And so the first part was simple. Uh, we, we needed to dig a hole, pour some cement, and then get the pole in the ground. And since I'm, I'm really such a, a handyman, I called up uh, Bo McGee, our worship leader, and uh, to come really tell me what to do. And so when I say tell me what to do, I really mean do it for me. So Bo and Mikey graciously came over to the house for this project. The hole was dug. The cement was poured. Uh, the pole was, was leveled and set. And then I just cheered them on the entire time. And then um, several days later, I got the rest of the goal out of the box. And since I'm such a handyman, I called up um, Brian White, who just uh, did our communion devotional, to come help me put the rest of the thing together. And after several hours, not an exaggeration, several hours, we officially had the basketball goal up in our driveway. I, I do have a picture. Look how cool you look. Um, yeah, there it is. This is the completed, and uh, the kids play basketball on that hardly ever, but there you go. Um, you know, I, I was reading, studying, praying through our passage this morning, and, and one element of that, that process kept coming to my mind. You know, I, I think the thing that made me the most nervous about all that is that I would uh, ruin the cement process because you can, you can take apart things and put them back together, but cement, you know, well, cement by its very nature is to become hardened. Like it, it takes, it does, it takes intentional effort and mixing to keep this thing a certain texture until it's ready to set. But if you leave <clears throat> the cement for too long, well, by its very nature, it becomes hardened. So if you can see the title of this message, you can just read a few lines of the passage today. You already know where I'm going. Friends, we need to know that by our very nature, by our very own sin nature, our, our hearts are in a position to be hardened by sin. It's Romans 5.12. It says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. So sin has entered the world through one man, Adam, in the garden. The death has spread to all men because all men sin. So your heart and your mind and your will, like left to its own demise, will quickly be hardened by the sin in you and around you. So it's a battle. And to believe that it is not a battle is to already be in the process of losing the battle that you deny. It's Romans 7, verse 21. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, well, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, and it's waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So, Church, evil lies close at hand. It does. And if you allow it, if we allow it, our hearts will be hardened by sin. So, friends, my question for us is, is your heart growing calloused? Because Hebrews chapter 3 is going to show us how, how to avoid such a deadly pattern in our own lives. And so... We'll be in Hebrews chapter 3, getting close to finishing chapter 3 this morning. But if you have a digital Bible, I'll read out of the ESV. If you've got a bulletin, it's all there. But before we read the passage, let's pray together. God, we uh, come before you and... And I, I, I just pray that we would understand the seriousness of it all. That there is not a person here 
that is exempt from this reality that sin has a way of doing things in our heart and in our mind and our soul. God, it just, it makes us numb. It hardens us to the truth of the gospel. At its core, it deceives us. So God, I pray that you would teach us a better way. God, that we would have healthy patterns and healthy thinking in our life. We might see, even as we have already been singing this morning, we might see the promises of your word. So God, we, we just pray that you would teach us and we ask these things in your son's name. Amen. So let's start in verse 7. Hebrews chapter 3, I'll start in verse 7. It says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Well, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Verse 12. Well, take care, brothers, lest there be in, in any in you of an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is still called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ if, if indeed we hold fast our original confidence firm to the end. As the Holy Spirit says, that's verse 7. So this is not a word from an East Tennessee preacher. This is a word from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not an idea. The Holy Spirit is not a manifestation. The Holy Spirit is not a feeling. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's role, among many things, is to point us to Jesus Christ, the Word. It's literally what Jesus tells us about in the Gospel of John, John 15, verse 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. The role of the Holy Spirit is not to fill the atmosphere so we can feel emotional during a worship service. Can that happen? Of course. Like, I, I, like I, I do, I hope to God that the truth of the gospel makes us emotional sometimes. But the role of the Holy Spirit is to point us to Christ, that he is the word. And when that happens, when we are pointed to the word, well, if the Holy Spirit's involved, we'll be convicted of our sin according to the word. Again, literally what Jesus talks about in the gospel of John. So John chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come, but if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father, and you will, and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. So that's who has the mic this morning. The Holy Spirit, in Hebrews 3, the Holy Spirit says, and then we get several Old Testament references in verses 7 through 11. So just going back, looking at verses 7 through 11 today, if you hear his voice. So I hope you're listening to his voice. Do not harden your heart as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They've not known my ways. 
And as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Well, what's that a reference to? We, we mentioned this last week with Moses, that Moses has led the house of God out of Egypt to the promised land of Canaan. And instead of trusting and obeying God, they chose to rebel. They, they chose an unbelieving heart. And so Israel, they found themselves in the wilderness for 40 years. You know, it's not like they didn't see the Lord's powerful faithfulness to them over and over and over again. The plagues in Egypt, the splitting of the Red Sea, the manna from heaven, the thunder of the mountain, and even then, it's just this active rebellion after rebellion after rebellion from God's people. But, but Hebrews 3, 7 through 11, it's actually a specific reference to Psalm 95. So for context, we'll look at Psalm 95. We'll start in verse 7. It says, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as at Meribah, as on the day of Massa, in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work for 40 years. I loathed that generation and said, They are a people who go astray in their heart. And they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And so in Psalm 95, we get this really a hint of what's going on here in the text. Now, this message, to be honest, is it's going to carry over to next Sunday. Next Sunday, we'll focus on the line, they shall not enter my rest. But today, and it goes hand in hand, I want to focus on the line, do not harden your hearts. So in Psalm 95, verse 8, we get a glimpse of what, has happened to God's people in the wilderness, by the way, of two words there. So the first word in Psalm 95, verse 8, is Meribah, which means quarreling. If you remember from last week, like we referenced that the people of Israel, they've been quarreling with Moses in the wilderness because they're just so thirsty. In fact, th that's what we find them often doing. They're arguing they're complaining, they're quarreling with Moses and their God. And then you get a second word in Psalm 95, verse 8, called Masa, which means testing. So God's people, in their complaining, begin to test God. God told Moses to speak to the rock and water would pour out. So he wants to bless his children. He wants to provide for his children. And instead, Moses wanted to test God, and he hit that rock two times with the staff, and needless to say, God was furious, and surprise, surprise, that place is called Meribah. Isn't it interesting in our passage that growing calloused is a heart that begins to complain about everything and then put God to test in everything? God, why can't I have this? God, why did you do this? God, why'd you allow this to happen? God, why won't you heal this? God, why did you ignore this? God, if you do this, we'll, we'll do this for you. Or God, if I do this for you, will you do this for me? We certainly know better than an Israelite in the wilderness how many times we've complained and tested our God. And certainly there are terrible things that happen. And we don't get the why answers to those on this side of eternity. But I, I'll say something painful that applies to many of us in this life. Rather than submitting to the Lord and following his ways, we would rather blame him for our own foolish choices and then the rebellion of other people around us. That's the story of Hebrews 3. It's a heart growing cold and calloused in their own rebellion. And so we get the main question of the passage, a question that we need to ask ourselves. Is my heart growing calloused? Here's what I know about preaching. We think sermons are for everyone else but ourselves. So don't answer that question for your coworker, for your family member, 
for your friend, ask yourself the question, look in the mirror. How eternally dangerous it is to have a heart that has been hardened by sin, that no one is exempt from that happening. I can preach here faithfully for another 30 more years and then slowly fall into a trap of a hardened heart at the end of the ministry. No one is exempt. So I'm, I'm pleading with us to ask ourselves the question, is my heart growing calloused? And the truth is, you may not be entirely sure of the answer. So I want to give us three extra questions to consider from those verses, really from verses 12 through 14 specifically. So as we reflect on the word this morning, let me give you three questions. Here's your first question. Am I investing in what eternally matters? Am I investing in what eternally matters? Look down at verse 12. It says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Take care or see to it. See to it that there's not an evil, unbelieving heart in you. How do you do that? How do you know? Well, let me keep it simple, kind of. Let me keep, keep it simple. I'll just say what you really believe this morning, what you really believe will inform how you really live. Or let me ask a question that is asked, asked by uh, Dr. Del Tackett. He put together the Truth Project that they are studying on Wednesday nights. Jeremy is doing a great job leading that down here in the Fellowship Hall. It's a simple question. Um, I think he, he really asked right at the beginning. He says, do you really believe that what you believe is really real? Many of us grew up in church and maybe never slowed down enough to even consider that question. That what we believe truly dictates the course of our lives, our schedules, our desires, our choices, and we all believe in something. You either believe in the, in the temporary things of this world, or you believe in the eternal living God. So if you want to know, if your heart is growing calloused, I think I would say, well, look, look at the things that you're investing in right now. Is your money your time, your energy, being invested in things that are going to last 10,000 years from now. Because if it isn't, as a Christian, I don't think you really believe what you say you believe. Let me gently say this. Pagans, pagans haven't been coming to Appalachia to fold clothes, feed the hungry, and shovel mud out of homes. It's been the response of the local church. It's been brothers and sisters in Christ from around the country. It's, it's men and women serving temporary needs with this eternity in mind. It's the famous D.L. Moody quote. Maybe you've heard it, maybe you haven't, but really every time I hear this sentence, it just forces me to a moment of repentance where he would say our Greatest fear should not be a failure, but of succeeding at something that doesn't really matter. What's the point of gaining the whole world if it means your heart became hardened in the process? What's the point of climbing the corporate ladder if it means your heart became hardened in the process? What's the point of an extravagant retirement if your heart became hardened in the process. Colossians 3, verse 1, it says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Isn't it interesting the way verse 12 puts that in the text today? And maybe we didn't catch it. But looking back at verse 12, 
It doesn't say a busy schedule will cause you to fall away. A bad health diagnosis will cause you to fall away. An unanswered prayer will cause you to fall away. A bad experience at a church will cause you to fall away. A life of suffering will cause you to fall away. Friends, it is what it is. It actually says an evil, unbelieving heart will cause you to fall away from the living God. It's a denial of faith. It's apostasy. So if you really believe what you believe is really real, well, invest in what eternally matters. Change your thinking. Change your spending. Change your schedule. Change your life. Change your purpose. Change your mission. But the second question that will be helpful for us as we look at the passage. Number two, am I centering my life around exhortation? It's a fair question. Am I centering my life around exhortation? Verse 13 really is, is one of my favorite verses in, in Hebrews. I might say that a lot during this study, but like, what's going to keep us from apostasy? What's going to keep us from bailing on Christ? What's going to keep us from an unbelieving heart? Well, verse 13, it says, Exhort one another every day, as long as it's still called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So first, you know, let's talk about what exhortation is. Exhortation is to encourage someone in the faith based on the Word of God. And, and that happens really in many different ways. So I'll give some examples. Sometimes it's to encourage you to think differently. Sometimes it's to encourage you to live differently. Sometimes it's encourage you to use your spiritual gifts. Sometimes it's to encourage you to keep going. Exhortation is centered around the Word of God for rebuking, Correcting, motivating, lifting up one another in love. In fact, that's why we even have the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 13, verse 22. I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I've written to you briefly. And according to verse 13, how often should we be doing that? There's not a lot of us, so we, what does it say? How often? Every day. Let me talk to you about what that actually looks like. Let me, I'm just going to get real practical here. First, it's individually. So right now, Carter County in America, we have access to God's Word. We can exhort ourselves by reading the Word every day. We can listen to podcasts from preachers from around the country. We can read books that encourage us in the faith. That's what I've tried to center my life around. I read my Bible every day. Do I miss days? Well, yeah, I do. And so I used to say like, well, that's my aim. I try to read my Bible every day. No, I'm gonna read my Bible every day and then sometimes you fail. I read my Bible every day. I listen to sermons from other preachers that just try to explain the word. Like, you don't have to be a seminary grad to do these things. You can start today. So first, it's individually, but let me be very clear. Verse 13, that's, like, that's not the intention. Because the people of God are not a scattered people, but a gathered people. Do we go on vacation? Do we get sick? Do we have to work sometimes? Like, of course. You don't have to go to church every Sunday to be a Christian. We say things like that to lower the bar to make ourselves feel better. But friends, you don't need the church every Sunday. You need the church every day. Like Sunday alone, it just isn't enough. Let me, let me phrase it like this. It's difficult to exhort someone you don't even know. The, like the challenge of Scripture is not to coast in the pews or these chairs and pray that someone would encourage you. That's not verse 13. It's to take initiative to know the body of Christ, to know names, to know stories, to know the word, to encourage someone in the local church. People need that. 
Think of it this way. There are eternal souls in this local church that depend on you doing that. You aren't going to exhort anyone when you're by yourself in a tree stand or a hay field. The people of God are a gathered people from Genesis to Revelation. In fact, some of us even have this spiritual gift of exhortation. It's Romans 12, verse 6. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, well, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches and is teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So some of us right now in this church have the spiritual gift of exhortation, and y'all ain't, you're not using it. Encourage others. <laughs> Let me add the extra and important layer. We must also be willing to be exhorted by people that actually know us, and that one's difficult. The church is not a building. Blah, blah, blah. All right, man, like I get it. We get it. It's a gathered people. And we can gather outside in the wet grass next week if y'all want. I would prefer not to. So since we have a building, we'll gather inside the building. But it's a gathered people. And gathered people mean they're willing to be exhorted by someone that really knows them. So let's go there. Um, with the power of the internet, I'm just going to be super blunt. Listening to other preachers is really healthy. I do it, and I would encourage you to do it. This isn't, we're not a cult. Like, I don't need to be the only Bible teacher in your life. Listen to other solid preachers online. But that can't be your only source of exhortation. Charles Stanley didn't know you. God rest his soul. John Piper doesn't know you. John MacArthur doesn't know you. Matt Chandler doesn't know you. Alistair Begg doesn't know you. Greg Laurie doesn't know you. And you can add whatever famous preacher you're listening to. I'm not saying we should stop listening to some of these people, but if famous preachers that don't know you are your only source of exhortation, I'm deeply concerned for you. This is a question for you, for myself, for every preacher. Are you able to be exhorted from the word by someone that actually knows your name, knows your family, knows your story, and knows what you wrestle with. Because if you can't do that, or if you're above that, if you're God's gift to exhorting others and not able to receive it from others, I promise you, your heart is in serious danger of being hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And sin is deceitful. So it, it actually convinces you that you're right and everyone else is wrong. Exhortation means hearing that you're wrong sometimes. Lord knows I'm wrong sometimes. I need to hear that according to the word. I'm not above that. I've been here over five years now. I've been wrong lots of times. <laughs> and, and godly men and women have encouraged me in the word when that happens. And I know our first response, we usually become defensive and sometimes angry. So church, it takes a lot of gospel humbleness to be exhorted by someone that actually knows you. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Time is running out. We're not in the first quarter, in the fourth quarter. So what should we be doing while we wait for the Lord? Among many things, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another. Build one another up just as you are doing. Encourage one another. Build one another up every day. Like, don't you want to help make East River Park a church like that? So I'm asking us the hard question, 
the heart question, are we centering our lives around exhortation every day? So the next question, last question, is really in the same line. Am I choosing faith every single day? Verse 14 of the passage, it says, For we have come to share in Christ, or more accurately, we have become partners in Christ. Like that's our affiliation as brothers and sisters in Christ. We don't lock arms because we always agree. We don't lock arms because we have every theological agreement. We lock arms because we are partners in Christ. For we have become partners or have come to share in Christ, verse 14, if. That's, that's conditional. Meaning, the first part is true only if the second part is true. Meaning, you don't share in Christ if you don't hold fast to Christ until the end. It's the same kind of exhortation of preaching of Paul and 1 Corinthians. Chapter 15, it says, Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if... If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. I gave my life to Christ, or my life to Christ at a um, small Southern Baptist church in Kentucky. I was in elementary school, baptized in the water, received my certificate, and I am confident that I understood the gospel back then, and I'm confident that the Holy Spirit invaded my tiny little heart back then, but friends, you know, if I spent the rest of my life from that moment rejecting Christ, believing everything else that was contrary to the gospel, Scripture would not affirm my salvation. Verse 13 alone would not affirm my salvation. And I know this is a convoluted discussion at the end of a message, but faith isn't just a decision you make at VBS in grade school. Faith is, is a decision we make every single day. And you know, truth be told, it's a decision we make every single hour, every single moment. Faith in what? Not faith in work, not faith in emotions. Faith in the gospel of Christ Jesus. It's Ephesians 2. 2 verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not your own doing, it's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. I don't do props. That might be your first prop in five years, so enjoy that right there. Um, I'm not, this is not, we're not going to collect a special offering. All right. My children, they have this little money jar on the bookshelf in our home. Um, when the family collects coins, we put them in that jar. And I know physical money um, is becoming more and more rare. Just a fun little thing they've done for a while. And so a few times a year, they'll want to buy something from the jar. And we ask the same question every time. Do you have enough? Um, it actually has, I mean, you can look at it later, it's got a little digital counter on the top of the lid. I think that's been broken for many years, but uh, so you just kind of have to look at the jar and guess. Never really know how much is in there until you take the coins out and count. Friends, I, I think that's how we think salvation works. We spend our lives trying to be good people, spend our lives trying to do good by others, and so we just keep adding coins to the jar. So the idea really is that when we get to glory, we can hand God the jar and just pray to God it's enough. Church, that's not how it works. I, I would say that, that certainly could be how heavenly rewards work. Like the good work on this side of eternity will gain eternal rewards in heaven. That, that is some serious motivation. It's just not how salvation operates. Salvation isn't filling the jar with good works. 
Salvation is holding fast to Christ because he's done all the work. So he has completely and fully filled that jar on your behalf. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30, And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom of God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, church, it's not really once saved, always saved, as much as it is once saved, always cling to the work of Christ. How do you avoid a hardened heart? Well, you know, really, it's pretty much the same point from last week. It's verse 13. Hold fast until the end. That's your main point. Hold fast until the end. So let's pray together. Father, thank you so much uh, for your word. God, that truly it, salvation is not us working and working and hoping to God we've done enough. It is clinging to the full and completed work of Christ Jesus. So that's what we're going to hold on to until the bitter end. Everything that Christ has accomplished for us, the perfect sacrifice. So God, we're thankful uh, for the truth of your word. And I, I do pray that, that we take these questions and self-reflect from your word, God, that we would really ask ourselves, are we creating patterns in our life that would harden our heart through the deceitfulness of sin? God, help us to be a church that full of individuals that are humble enough to be exhorted. And so we pray these things in your son's name. Amen.